Stuttgart. This is a part of the basics of quantum gravity uh, school organized by the Inter International Society for Quantum Gravity. And today, Hal is going to continue his discussion on gravity as a gauge theory. He will again pause at the middle of the lecture to take questions. And then in the end, we will also have additional time for questions. So with this, thank you, Hal, and please go ahead. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, delighted to be here again. And I'll just jump right in. Um, as I did last time, I, I have a couple of review questions for you. Uh, so uh, I won't leave these up long because it's being recorded and it doesn't make sense on YouTube. But uh, just for a moment, think about the question, what is the Ashtakar electric field? That's where we left off last time. And, and I'll give you the answer right off the bat. Um, it, we decided to think about triads, which are a way of sort of taking a square root of the metric on a spatial slice. And then we densitize that triad. So to remind you of my notation, uh, Q is the spatial metric, uh, Q without indices is the determinant, and uh, the E is this uh, triad variable. And the triad connects the coordinate frame with a local Lorentz frame. I was encouraging you to think of this as sort of the equivalence principle, adopting the local frame that you were thinking of at, at the point. And uh, we showed some things about the triads and tetrads. Uh, so this is the sense in which it's a square root. If you take uh, E tilde with E tilde, contract the internal index, that's the I index, uh, you get the, the spatial metric back with a factor of the determinant. Uh, so you can use this to construct the inverse spatial metric, that's what's on the next line, and uh, if you wanted to, you could take the inverse of that and, and get the spatial metric. Um, but more than doing that, what we decided to do was to organize this electric field into a two form. Uh, so we contracted uh, the Ashtakar electric field with an epsilon and two the wedge of two coordinate differentials. And this is what we call the, um, this two form, this electric two form. Um, I apologize, uh, last week I had a small notational mistake here. Um, I've been trying to only put tildes on things that are densities. It's sort of a visual reminder that it doesn't exactly transform as a tensor, but actually t transforms with this determinant factor. However, once we make this contraction, this thing isn't a density anymore. It actually transforms properly as a, a, as a tensor where everything cancels out. You can think of this as an area form, and we'll do that actually as we move forward. Um, I, I shouldn't say it transforms as a tensor. I should say it's invariant under transformations. And so on this, I'll leave off the tilde uh, since it, it transforms more like a, a form, an, a volume form or an area form. Okay, so that's reminders about the electric field. This is going to be one of our main uh, variables throughout today's discussion, and, and I'll come back to it again and again. Uh, my next question for you all uh, was, uh, I'm actually just going to uh, give you back some of your questions. So last week, uh, one of the, the students in the course was asking what the pointing vector was in the form language. And I confessed that I'd never worked it out myself. And it's not a hard calculation, but it's kind of interesting. You can recast it in a couple different ways. So I'm reminding you here in the first two lines of the electric one form and the magnetic two form that we introduced. And uh, you uh, want to get the, the components of what in the usual vector calculus language is E cross B. And so the, the easy way to do that is to use the spatial Hodge star. I'm not using the full uh, space-time Hodge star, but just the one on the spatial uh, surface you could think of uh, Euclidean three space. And if you do that, you can construct this three form and its components are exactly the components of um, the pointing vector. Of course, you don't have to work with a three form, you can dualize and uh, work with a one form. So this would be another way of thinking about the, the pointing vector. And if you wanted to stay more covariant, here I'm sort of working on the spatial slice, but if you wanted to stay more co uh, covariant, you could uh, use the field strength two form that we introduced last time. 
And you may remember that F sort of had the electric components in the time part and dual of F had the magnetic components in the time part. And so if you contract those two forms with your four velocity, you pick out those components and you basically construct E cross B. And if you wanna work with the, the three form version, the P that I introduced up here, you contract uh, your four velocity with the metric and that lowers it and you can build a three form this way. And it has exactly the same components. So I'm just showing you how to do all of these things in form language to give you more experience with it so you can think about it more. Uh, and it was a nice question that, that one of you asked. I did uh, look up who it was, but then I, in the intervening days, I forgot which was which. So I'm sorry. One was Diego and another. <laughs> but at any rate. Um, all right. Another question that was asked that I wanted to briefly address. Uh, I was happy with my answer to this question. Uh, one of the students asked, uh, when can you write a physical theory as a gauge theory? And my answer was that that's hard to know up front. Uh, and what I was thinking of when I said that was GR. For many years, we didn't have a nice gauge theoretic formulation of GR. And so I was thinking, yeah, it's hard to do this. It's hard to, as a physicist, start with the local uh, information that you have and build up the gauge theory. But I thought I should uh, come back around to this point and, and make a broader point, which is that if you understand the global structure of your theory, then you actually can tell whether it's going to be a gauge theory or not. It turns out gauge theories are mathematically always examples of what are called principal bundles. So you have some base manifold and over every point of that manifold, you have fibers. Uh, and in the case of a principal bundle, those fibers are always groups. And, uh, and this uh, turns out to be um, a way to think about a gauge theory where the gauge potential form that we discussed last time is the connection on this fiber bundle. And it tells you how to parallel transport things from one fiber to another. So a beautiful example of this is, again, a drawing from uh, Penrose on the left here. And he's illustrating the so-called Hopf bundle, which is, um, as a manifold, it's S3, the three sphere. But that S3, you can view it as a base of uh, the two sphere. Over every point of that two sphere, you have a fiber, which is S1, the circle. And S1 as a circle is just the group U1, the unitary one by one matrices, or SU1, if you like. Um, and uh, so you can actually construct S3 as a, a fiber bundle. And this shows up all over physics. I mean, I can't tell you how many different places. Uh, so Penrose was interested in this because of work on twisters. Um, the picture at the right is about knotted electric and magnetic fields. It's from a paper on knotted fields. Um, in my PhD, I wrote about the hop bundle extensively because I was interested in the two-dimensional harmonic oscillator and how it relates to, to angular momentum and to spin networks. And so uh, I actually give a very careful step-by-step -step construction of the Hopf bundle uh, following the, the diagram on the right in my PhD, if you're interested. Um, more generally, if you're interested in this geometrical take on gauge theories, uh, Gregory Neighbor has a lovely book called Topology, Geometry, and Gauge Fields that kind of goes a step more deeply into the principal bundle picture than the Baez and Moonian book that I was recommending last week. Okay. So I'm almost done with these review questions, but I had one more piece I wanted to follow up on, which is that one of you is asking me about the geometric, or sometimes it's called the Clifford product. And I don't think I was quite fair to the questioner. I sort of said, well, yeah, but people don't know it. And so maybe we shouldn't use it. But uh, I was thinking about it and I realized there's a beautiful way to use it today. <laughs> In, in today's discussion. And so I, I'm going to backpedal and I'm going to introduce this geometric product uh, and I'll use it. I'll use it to prove something that is actually kind of hard to prove in other ways, but in this way it's just super easy to prove. Okay, so um, normally when I teach undergraduates, I say there's no such thing as a product of vectors and I make a big deal of it. I say there's only only special kinds of products of vectors. And I tell them that there's the dot product, which combines two vectors to give a scalar. And there's the cross product or the wedge product, whichever you prefer, which combines two vectors to give another vector. 
But last uh, week, we learned that you can think of the wedge product as actually giving you a so-called bivector. It's not really a vector. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that spans a two-dimensional plane, which is the span of the in here u and v vectors. So the idea of Clifford's is to introduce a product of vectors. And so notationally, we're going to just use juxtaposition. So u vector next to v vector means form their product. And what's weird about this definition is that it doesn't keep the rank constant. It combines a scalar and a bivector. That's something we usually don't allow ourselves to do. We usually use type checking. You have to add vectors to vectors as a way to kind of make sure we don't make mistakes. But Clifford says, forget it, do it. <laughs> it's useful. And add a scalar to a bivector. So this is the idea of the geometric product. So I can illustrate this quickly. It, it's very easy to see. Uh, let's take an orthonormal basis, the usual one for R3, x hat, y hat, and z hat. And let's form the Clifford product, say, of x hat and y hat. Well, the dot product of x hat and y hat, because I said it was orthonormal, is 0. And I add that to the wedge. And so uh, for the this Clifford product of two vectors that are orthonormal, you just get the wedge. And we already know the wedge is anti-symmetric, so I can reverse the order at the cost of a minus sign. And well, we know that ortho ortho normal vectors give a wedge product that's the same as the Clifford product, so we can uh, convert this back to a Clifford product. And we learn that at least on products of two one vectors, you get an anti-symmetric Clifford product. So that's interesting. Uh, Okay, let's try this on some bivectors. Uh, so I have a question. Use... Yeah, please. So, uh, how to understand this Clifford product in terms of like, is there is like physical interpretation of this thing? Yeah, so that's kind of what I'm building up to. Um, I mean, the the immediate geometric interpretation is the one you're used to. This is no different from the dot product you're used to. So this is giving a scalar that's equal to the magnitude of one vector times the magnitude of the other times the cosine of the angle between them. So geometrically, this is just the standard dot product. And we introduced what this other piece is last week. This is the area that's spanned by yeah. u and v. We can think of that as, uh, in, at least as its magnitude, as being u times v times the sine of the angle between them. But it's a more subtle uh, thing because because the orientation is not perpendicular to their span, but is just oriented within that span. And one of the things that we'll see today is that that's actually quite meaningful and interesting. So I'll build up to that, but, um, but that's the geometric intuition. And you can use that geometric intuition for all sorts of different applications. So if I was taking R, the position vector of a particle, and P, the momentum vector of that particle, well, then this is R dot P and R wedge P. Our wedge P is related to angular momentum. Our dot P, well, that's um, that's a combination of position, velocity, and mass. So that, that was not something we immediately interpret, but you can build all of your normal intuitions on those sorts. So of like terms. this plus is uh, like a normal addition plus or like just different, like indicative uh, thing? Um, good, that's a good question. Uh, as I was saying, we're adding things of different ranks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what we mean by plus here is that it satisfies all the usual axioms. It, plus is a commutative algebra in the normal way. You can rewrite this the plus the other way around. You can do all the things you're used to. You can at, introduce additive inverses, all of that stuff. But I agree with you that I'm never going to kind of really combine this piece with this piece. It's a formal sum. They just come along together. And I can add other geometric products, and the scalar pieces will add, and the bivector pieces will add, but they kind of just stay apart from each other. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yep. Good. Yep. Yes. OK, so why am I backtracking and reintroducing all this stuff that people don't know about geometric products? It's really because of what they do with bivectors, which is fascinating and really nice. So uh, let's assume that B is a bivector, and I'm going to take it to be orthogonal, simple, so x hat, wedge, y hat. And let's look at what the Clifford product of B with B is. This is another weird thing about the Clifford product. You can just keep going up in ranks. So it just gets higher and higher rank. 
Um, but we just saw a moment ago that uh, x wedge y is the same as x Clifford y. So let's simplify this as x Clifford y, x Clifford y. And we just saw also that the x and y commute, uh, anti-commute, excuse me, they have a minus sign. So I can rewrite it this way. Ah, but now once I rewrite it this way, what is the Clifford product of x with x? Well, x hat dot x hat gives me one, but x hat wedge x hat, we saw very carefully last time, that's zero. X wedge x, wedge x would be negative itself, it must be zero. So the Clifford product of x with x just gives me one, Clifford product of y with y just gives me one, and so overall I get minus one. In other words, the Clifford product of two bivectors is minus one. Does that remind you of anything? It's a lot like the imaginary unit, but I didn't have to do any complex numbers, right? No complex numbers, but bivectors, when you use the Clifford product, act like the imaginary unit. So in particular, you can just keep iterating by vector multiplication. If you do b times b times b, well, I just put parentheses. That's what I mean by a product. I can parenthesize however I want. And this factor turns into minus 1, and I get minus b. So strings of pro Clifford products of by vectors reduce down really nicely to scalars and by vectors, always. So, um, that's an introduction to the Clifford product or the geometric product, and uh, I'll use this fact later today. It's a really useful fact, and I'm going to try and motivate something for you using it. So as much as you can over the course of the next hour, try to remember this, this fact about bivectors. And I think for me, remembering it, it's really useful to say, oh, it's a lot like complex numbers. It's like Bs are acting like the imaginary unit. All right, that's enough of questions from last time. Let's start today. As I have been doing, I'll do it with a prologue. And I should confess that I've been enjoying uh, the storytelling of, about the cats. Of course, it's a lot of fun and it's silly. Uh, but I want you to know something also fun and silly, which is that there really is a cat at the heart of quantum gravity. And, uh, and I want to tell you why. So the prologue for now is, is to try to explain why there's a cat, a falling cat in quantum gravity. All right, so let's imagine uh, the static weak field limit of general relativity. In that limit, the metric uh, decomposes into a really simple form we have the so-called Newtonian potential, capital Phi here, in the time-time component of the metric. And it shows up also in the space-based components, but it's a very simple, uh, very symmetric metric. And in this limit, uh, gravity actually behaves a lot like electromagnetism. So I've been telling you we call it the Ashtakar electric field, but I'm going to try and motivate for you why we do that now. So you can think of the Newtonian gravitational field, the one you learned in undergraduate, uh, as just negative the gradient of this Newtonian potential. And it satisfies an exact analog of Gauss's law in electromagnetism, namely that the divergence, I'm sorry, there should be a vector symbol on this G, the divergence of this Newtonian gravitational field is uh, proportional to the mass density contained in the region. So just like we do in electromagnetism, we can integrate this up and get a sort of Gauss's law for gravity. Of course, this is in the static weak field limit, but uh, the area integral over a surface of the Newtonian gravitational field is equal to negative 4 pi times Newton's constant times the mass contained in that region. So this is the picture that I'm showing at the right here. It's exactly like what you know from electromagnetism. Um, one notational oddity that I'm doing here, I, I think in most textbooks you would see d a vector, the differential area of the surface. I mean that same thing. I'm talking about the oriented differential area of the surface, and I'll take the orientation to be outward, but I'm calling it e. And, uh, and I just want to warn you about that. I mean the area form, but I'm going to call it e and you'll see why. 
Okay, so we have a Gauss's law for this Newton Newtonian gravitational field. So now I want you to do a special case. Let's think about um, a region that contains no mass. Okay, so we're, we're going to take a closed surface, but it's not going to have any mass on the inside. And we're also going to consider this surface to be very small. Um, the reason I want to do that is I want to be able to imagine that my Newtonian gravitational field is constant in the vicinity of this surface. And then we can just do our Gauss law calculation like we normally do. And of course, because the region contains no mass, the Gaussian integral has to be zero. Okay. But uh, I've also taken the gravitational field to be constant, so I can pull it out of the integral. And I can think of this oriented surface integral. But I chose orientation totally arbitrarily here, right? This is a Gaussian surface. I could orient this thing however I want. Or you could think of reorienting the constant gravitational field. And so if this holds for all of those cases, it must be that the vectorial surface area of my surface S, that is the addition of all these little differential areas, must be zero. This is a fact about Euclidean geometry. It's a fact you might not have ever encountered. I don't know. Some people will have and some not. But we derived it in a really interesting way. We reached a conclusion about Euclidean geometry by understanding it as a consequence of the gravitational Gauss law. And I really like this logic here. But the fact is that uh, if you add up oriented area elements over a closed surface, you're going to get zero. OK, so let's do this for a special geometry. What's the special geometry? Let's take a polyhedron. We don't have to take a nice smooth curved surface. We can take any surface. And let's take the surface of a tetrahedron. So what does this uh, consequence that we just learned mean? Well, over each one of these, the surface area element is constant. And so I'm just adding up the same direction. So I get the total area of the face in the direction normal to that face. So that's what I mean, for example, by E3 vector. Its magnitude is equal to the area, but its direction is perpendicular to the face. And what we've just learned from our gravitational Gauss law is that the sum of these vectors must be zero. Why? Because the, this polyhedral surface is closed. So they have to add up to zero. So this is a fact about Euclidean geometry that we've just derived. Um, and remarkably, Hermann Minkowski, uh, of special relativity fame, of Minkowski space, uh, was a mathematician and was really interested in convex polyhedra. And he gave exactly this as a way of defining convex polyhedra at the turn of the 19th century. He proved that you can always, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence by, between all convex polyhedra and sets of vectors that add up to zero. And those vectors can be interpreted always as being perpendicular to the faces of the polyhedron and having magnitudes equal to the area. So we've, we've rediscovered Minkowski's theorem. Go ahead, Satish. Paul, is there any way we can relate this to Euler's formula of the faces uh, and the edges? That would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So there must be a Gauss-Bonnet way of looking at this. Um, but actually, I, I don't know it off the top of my head. Uh, but let, let's think about that, because yes. there's got to be. Yes. Thank you. OK. Um, there's one more thing I want to say about this. Uh, I would like to also express the volume of this tetrahedron in terms of these same vectors, if I could. It would, it would just be a nice thing that I, if I could characterize both the areas and the volume of the tetrahedron this way. And it turns out you can, and it's relatively easy. This is my first exercise for you to do today. So the idea of the proof is as follows. You uh, calculate the E2 vector or any of the face vectors by considering the edge vectors that border it. Uh, so give those edge vectors magnitudes equal to the length of the edge and directions along the edge. And if you form a cross product or a wedge product, whichever you prefer, 
uh, and, and take one half of it, you'll get exactly the area vector E2. Um, but you may have already encountered a formula for the volume of a tetrahedron in terms of its edge vectors. It turns out the volume of the tetrahedron is one sixth the triple product of three of its edge vectors in a right handed sense. Um, so combining these two facts, I encourage you to compute E1 dot E2 cross E3 and prove that it's actually the volume of the tetrahedron squared with a factor of two ninths out front. So it's a, it's a nice exercise. And, and now apparently we can write lots of properties about this tetrahedron in terms of these, uh, these flux vectors, these electric flux vectors. OK. Well, there's a reason that I'm kind of blurring the line between electric flux, Ashtakar electric flux, and area is because it is blurred. They are the same thing. <laughs> so let me prove that to you. Uh, you're used to this formula that we use all the time in metrical GR. That is, the length of a curve gamma is the integral along the curve of, well, we often write this as the square root of ds squared, but if you choose a parameter tau, you can write it as in this form, these parameterized derivatives of your coordinates contracted with the spatial metric in this case, because I'm working on a spatial slice. It's also possible and interesting to write the area of any curved surface, a general surface, as an integral over the surface of, uh, again, parameterized coordinates contracted with the metric in this pattern. This, if you've done any string theory, you certainly recognize. Uh, if you haven't, you may not recognize. You just might not have calculated it this way before. So my second exercise for you today is to compute the differential area, well, is exactly the cross product we were mentioning. Take two little differential vectors, form their cross product, and this is its magnitude. You can, of course, rewrite the sine of the angle between them as square root of 1 minus the cosine squared. And I've gotten you off on proving this fact. So complete the rest of the steps, going from d area to this formula here, and you'll, uh, you'll feel confident that this is a way of describing the area of a surface. But let's try and express this in terms of the variables we've been thinking about. We've been thinking about electric flux variables. So my first step is going to be to use one of these index tricks. So this is uh, metric, metric, minus metric, metric. When you see that kind of thing, you're tempted to introduce two epsilons contracted on one index. Uh, in other words, epsilon, epsilon is equal to delta, delta, minus delta, delta. You've probably seen that kind of formula before. And if you use that together with our uh, metric, you'll actually recover this formula. Uh, interestingly, you'll recover it with a factor of the determinant of the spatial metric attached. So this is just a conversion of this formula into this one. Ah, but now here's a quiz for you going back to earlier today. When you see this combination, what do you immediately want to say? Oh, that's the electric triad, electric triad, right? The densitized triad is exactly this factor. So let's do that. This is equal to the densitized triad contracted along its internal index. OK. So I'm going to use this last formula to finish the proof that this is a really nice connection with the electric field, the Ashtakar electric field. All right, I've just rewritten the expression we just found, and now I'm going to reorganize it. I'm going to move one of the densitized triads to the beginning along with one of the epsilons. I'm going to move this d sigma d tau inside the square root, so I get two factors of it. Reorganize the other factors together. And now you're starting to really recognize our electric two form, right? The d sigma d tau cancel, we get dx a, dx b. They're contracted with an epsilon. This is the electric two form. So we've got two copies of the electric two form. They're contracted with each other. This is just saying that you can compute the area of a surface as the norm of the electric two form. <laughs> 
So Ashtakar's variables are doing what I was advertising in the very first lecture, if you remember. I was saying GR has outside in front exactly Planck area as its natural units. And the Ashtakar electric field is naturally computing areas, unlike the metric, which sort of naturally computes lengths. So uh, I think this is a really interesting aspect of these variables and, and worth kind of really taking note of. OK, so I've been telling kind of a couple of stories together. I've been telling you this gravitational Gauss law story. I'm connecting it now with the electric field story. Uh, we're going to call this the electric flux, and we see that it's exactly what I was computing in that gravitational Gauss law. All right. I find the taking of the norm in the integral of the last slide really annoying. I don't know if any of you have ever had this experience. This factor of square root that we get in both the length calculation and this area calculation is super annoying. And why are they there? Well, it's because we're trying to calculate the magnitude of the area and not keep track of any orientation. But that's a silly mistake. It's easier to keep track of orientation and not take norms. Just don't do it. <laughs> There's no reason to take the norm. So we can also calculate the electric flux just directly. Just integrate the two form over the surface element that you're interested in, and you'll get the oriented electric flux through that surface. And it's going to be an oriented version of the area. So the internal index I here gives the local inertial flux direction. So this is this funny thing that we were mentioning last uh, week about the, the electric flux or the triad, however you want to think about it. There's the coordinate frame. I've drawn it in purple here. But there's also the local inertial frame that, that the equivalence principle guarantees is there for us. And remember, the triad connects these two. And so the, the remaining index, the I index on this flux, is the internal one. It's the, what the local inertial observer would say about this direction. And that, of course, has to do with the coordinate system that they set up. So that's what the I is referring to. And I want you to really take note that the internal frame needn't align with the coordinate frame. They don't have to be the same at all. In fact, here in this picture, I align the z-axis, but I don't even need to do that. They, this is a general three frame, right? And this is starting to sound like the cat. We have a gauge freedom here, which is the gauge freedom of how we orient our local inertial frame with respect to our local coordinate frame. That's a orientation coordinate, right? Um, it's it's going to be even more like the cat in just a second. All right. I told you at the beginning that you should try to remember this fact about bivectors. And here's why. The electric field two form is a bivector. It's a two form. It has to be a bivector, right? It's, if you like, the, the vector space we're talking about is the local cotangent space at that point. So it's a bivector in that space. But the amazing thing, and this is where the geometric product helps you a lot to prove this, the amazing thing is that all bivectors always generate rotations. How? Well, they do it in the same way that e to the i theta generates a rotation of the complex plane. You form the exponential of theta times your normalized bivector, the, exactly the b I introduced at the beginning. And what do I mean by this exponential? I mean the same thing we always mean, the power series expansion of that exponential, but where the product I'm taking is the Clifford product. OK, so now I can just expand out and compute. And the 1 and the plus theta b, they just come along. But bb, that's the thing that we showed, is equal to negative 1. So that gives us minus theta squared over 2 factorial. And bbb, that's minus 1 times b, so that gives us the, ne the next minus. And 4b's, well, that's minus 1 times minus 1, so we get plus. You recognize how this is working? It's exactly like the complex exponential. Oops, I'm sorry. 
uh, so I can collect all the even terms and I can collect all the bivector terms and those collections give me exactly cosine theta plus sine theta times the bivector. In other words, this is generating a rotation, a rotation by theta in the plane of B. There's a small subtlety here, and I'm going to leave it as an exercise because I don't want to get caught up too much in the details here. But to use this thing to generate rotations of vectors, I'll let you check that you actually have to use the conjugation action. That is, I have to act by the exponential of the bivector on the left of the vector I want to rotate and act by the exponential of the bivector on the right of the vector with opposite signs. And it's this conjugation action that actually rotates V. How does it rotate V? It rotates the component of V that's in the B plane in the orientation of the B by vector. It's really quite beautiful. So a moment ago, I was telling you the I index of the electric field tells you about how this inertial frame is oriented with respect to your coordinate frame. But I want to tell you something else, and this is the profound insight, I think, of these Ashtakar uh, coordinates. We can also think of our I index as labeling the components of a Lie algebra. It's the Lie algebra of rotations. Why? Because the electric flux is a bivector, and bivectors always generate rotations. So we, uh, I'm, I'm being careful here. I'm being a little bit mathematician-y on you here. It turns out technically you should think of this as an element of the dual of the Lie algebra, but I'm not going to really go into that. But as Lie algebras, SU2 is the same as SO3. Of course, the groups are different, but the Lie algebras are the same. And that's the same as R3. So this I index that we were thinking of as components of a vector you can also completely consistently think of it as components of a Lie algebra. So what we're doing when we organize the uh, uh, Ashtakar electric field into the Ashtakar electric two form is we're taking a Hodge dual. That's what's allowing us to, to contract this uh, triad with this two form. And we're also using a basis in the Lie algebra of SU2, uh, I'm calling them tau i, and we're contracting that with the i index to get a complete vector. And I'm telling you, you can think of that as an angular momentum. Why an angular momentum? Well, it's angular momenta that generate rotations, and this thing generates a rotation. It generates a rotation in the internal space. So the Ashtakar electric field has a physical interpretation as the magnitude being the area and as the orientation piece of it being about the rotation that takes you from one frame to the other. All right, one or two last pieces and the story comes together. This furnishes an interpretation of the closure that we just found. We use the gravitational Gauss law to learn that the, the electric flux vectors of a tetrahedron close, they sum up to zero. But what is this vector that is the sum of all of these? We just learned that it generates a rotation. What does it rotate? It rotates all of the vectors. So you can think of e to the i, and now I'm just using the usual uh, SU2 basis. You could think of uh, poly matrices or of uh, the three-dimensional representation for this vectorial picture, uh, it generates rotation of all of the vectors. But does rotation of all of the vectors change the shape of the tetrahedron? Of course not, right? It changes how the tetrahedron is oriented in space. So it's gauge, right? This is exactly the orientation of the cat, except it's a tetrahedron. <laughs> So uh, these rotations um, are changing orientation, but not changing shape. That is, they're not changing the gauge invariant quantities that we're interested in, the geometry of this little grain of space. So the tetrahedron and the cat 
the falling cat are the same system, right? The falling cat, you remember what we were doing? We were taking a, a sequence of angular momenta of each of these masses and adding them up to zero because the cat was released from rest. But that's what we're doing in the tetrahedron too. These ha have interpretation as generators of rotations of angular momenta, and we're adding them up to zero to get closure, that is to get a closed surface. And so the tetrahedron is the cat system. It is the falling cat system. It's one more complicated step than I did for you. I think I only did three angular momenta adding up to zero. This would be four, but it's, uh, it's the same idea mathematically. So uh, the gauge invariant quantities, like the norm of the, each of these flux vectors or the dot product of each of these flux vectors, those are both rotationally invariant. Those capture the shape part of the tetrahedron and their gauge invariant quantities. It's only the embedded orientation of the tetrahedron, which the cat is demonstrating very well for us here. That, uh, that changes when we rotate the system. So um, I'll come back to this system again, and it was a rather long prologue today, but I think it really helps to connect uh, where we're going, which is the Ashtakar variables, to where we've been, which is this gauge formulation of, of this falling cat. All right, so let me finally give you uh, an overview of today. I'm going to move into discussing general relativity. We uh, set up the Ashtakar electric field, but we, we needed its conjugate variable. And the conjugate variable is a connection. And uh, so I'm going to spend the first part of today and really the long part of today uh, describing that for you. Uh, in the second part, I'm going to come back to this tetrahedron we just studied and study its uh, quantization. So that'll be the first uh, step we take in quantizing gravity. The, we're going to take this simple system, which is a, a tetrahedron, and quantize it. And that's going to be a really good warm up for the more complicated uh, quantization of space, uh, which is uh, using spin network states. Um, I'm going to get to introduce you to what a spin network state is today, but I'm not going to fully develop them. So I'm just calling it motivations, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue on next time with spin networks more fully and the dynamics of spin networks, which is the idea of spin forms or path integrals for, for quantum mechanics. All right, so let's dive into GR as a gauge theory. Um, I need to give you a little bit of um, motivation and where we're going uh, and a little bit of background in mechanics. So uh, as I was just mentioning, we want to find the variable that should be paired with the Ashtakar electric field. Uh, in other words, what I mean is we want to find a Hamiltonian formulation for GR in which we have identified the canonically conjugate variable. So um, if we think of the electric field as being a momentum variable, a P, we want to find the position variable Q such that the Poisson bracket of Q with P is, is equal to one. That's the starting point for many quantization approaches. It turns out that the answer is going to be an SU2 gauge potential. I've kind of just motivated why it's going to be that, but uh, we're going to call it A, and it's called the Ashtakar connection. It carries indices in the opposite way as the densitized triad. And what we mean by its Poisson bracket being one is that you have a Kronecker delta on the internal index, on the spatial index, and a Dirac delta on the positions at which we're evaluating these two fields. So the first step to uh, being able to find a canonically conjugate variable is to define a Poisson bracket. So that's what I need, I need to set up for you. Um, today is a bit more technical than the last two lectures, and uh, the, we'll get into the weeds a bit, and even so, I won't uh, be giving you all of the details, <laughs> so, uh, so I'll kind of warn you about that once or twice and, and point out some resources if you want to go deeper into this. All right. So I know everyone uh, here has uh, 
used the action and Lagrangian framework to derive equations of motion. But depending on how much exposure to mechanics you've had, you might not have seen that you can also use the action to derive what's called the symplectic potential theta and the symplectic two form. Uh, the symplectic two form is one of the ways that you can do mechanics. Um, and the Poisson bracket is sort of the dual way. One is more like a Lagrangian setup and the other's more like a Hamiltonian setup. And today all we're gonna do is use this symplectic two form to get the Poisson bracket. So let me just give you a very quick uh, preview of how this works in the context of one degree of freedom mechanical system. So what we do is we consider the variation of the action as you normally would. We take the variation in and vary the Lagrangian. We know what that means. It's dl dq times the variation of q plus dl dq dot variation of q dot. Uh, the annoying thing about this is that the, the variation of q and variation of q dot are uh, seemingly independent. We want to organize them together. So what we normally say is that we integrate this second term by parts and strip off the time derivative from the variation of q and put it on the dl dq dot. Uh, today I'm going to do that in a slightly more detailed way. I'm going to go ahead and uh, subtract off this term, but I'm also going to add it back on. And uh, adding it back on um, is going to teach us something interesting. Uh, here you see how it works. This time derivative acts on the dl dq dot and cancels this term. But you also have the product rule, and it acts on the dq, and we recover the original thing we, we had before. The reason for doing this is that this boundary term is actually quite interesting. This boundary term, well, dl dq dot, that's the definition of canonical momentum, so that's your p. And you notice that if I integrated this, the dt would go out, and I, my boundary term would be p dq. That is the definition of the symplectic potential. So just by taking a variation of the action and looking at its boundary terms, we were able to identify the symplectic potential. Uh, then what we do is we take the differential of this theta, this one form on phase space, and uh, here I've put a conventional minus sign in. This is an annoying convention in this business, but you gotta be consistent. And so uh, when I take that differential, I, I reorganize the two terms to get this uh, symplectic form, the symplectic two form. Okay, and then the last step uh, in this background material is that you can go uh, from the symplectic two form to the Poisson bracket as follows. Let's organize our phase space coordinates into a single vector of coordinates, Ci, with uh, the Qs first and then the Ps. Well, uh, that means that I can write omega in these coordinates, and you can check that if you do, um, you need a factor of one half here, but you get omega ij dq ci dq cj. And uh, the definition of the Poisson bracket is that you take the inverse matrix of these components and that's what you stick between the derivatives of your phase space functions with respect to the phase space variables in order to get the Poisson bracket. So this is how you go step by step from the potential to the symplectic form to the Poisson bracket. In my super simple example, let me try and sketch for you how this works. Well, we know already our two form is dq wedge dp. How am I gonna get that in this matrix? Well, this matrix has to be anti-symmetric, so it's one one component is zero and it's two two component is zero. But if I put a um, minus one in its one two component and a one in its two one component, let's see what happens. One two would be dq wedge dp. The minus one turns that into a plus. And if I put a one in the two one, that would be dp wedge dq, that reorients, and the two add up, and I get this back. So now I know that my matrix is 0, minus 1, 1, 0. If I invert that, I get exactly this standard Poisson bracket. 
So that's the story. I'm sorry I'm doing it a little quickly if you've never seen this before. On the other hand, I think many of you will have seen it, so I'm trying to balance. All right. So the idea that we're going to pursue is to do all of those same steps with general relativity. Um, this was first done by uh, Arnuit, Dezer, and Misner uh, in the 50s, the late 50s. And uh, it's quite a beautiful uh, process. And it, it's called the ADM formulation after those three people. So we start with the Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian or action. And uh, we make a space-time split. So we divide our space-time manifold into a time direction and spatial slices. Um, you can consider both the case where those spatial slices have boundary and where they don't. Uh, life is going to be a little simpler if I take the case where they have no boundary. Um, here and uh, later in the lecture, I follow again closely some of the work that Simone Speziale did in introducing um, loop quantum gravity uh, last year, the series of video lectures I've mentioned to you before. Um, he does the case with boundary if you're interested in checking that out. Um, after you make the space-time split, you work out the brackets along the lines that we just discussed. You do the variation of the action, you look for the boundary term. From that boundary term, you get the symplectic potential, symplectic two-form, and then the Poisson brackets. And once you've got the brackets, what they did was they found the conjugate variables of the theory. So this is how they construct the, the conjugate to the spatial variable they're using. In ADM, it's going to turn out that this is the spatial metric that they use, and we're going to find the conjugate variable to that. All right. Um, I'm good 55 minutes in, and I see there are lots of questions. So I, I, I'm going to go into ADM in detail in just a moment, but I think I should pause here and take some questions, and then uh, we'll come back to the ADM. Yeah, sounds good. Um, would you like to start with the ones in the Q&A? Sure. All right. Uh, Faikala says, Clifford algebras reminds me of quaternions. Uh, that's an excellent insight, Faikala, and it's, um, it's true. They are deeply related. Uh, Clifford was very much involved in the work with quaternions. I don't know if you know this, but Maxwell formulated electricity and magnetism in terms of quaternions first, actually. Uh, so the, the, all of the mathemati mathematicians and physicists of that era knew quaternions very, very well. And Clifford was partly building off of those insights. I think I mentioned last time that, um, that they're also very closely tied to Clifford algebras and fermions uh, through that path. Um, Deepan asks, could we couple matter fields to the Ashtakar triads? And does the local gauge phase or internal fermionic phase cause any changes to the rotation phase in the SU2 manifold of the triads or in orientation? Uh, really nice question, Deepan. Um, yes, uh, one of the reasons to go to the first order formalism, to this triad or tetrad formalism, is that uh, coupling matter, and in particular fermions, to gravity in the first order formalism is far, far simpler. Um, sometimes people say you can't do it in the second order formalism. I'm not sure I quite agree with that. You can always take quantities in the first order formalism, translate them over, but it's very, very unnatural. Whereas um, this analogy I've been making a couple of times that the triad uh, and tetrad are like square roots of the metric. I mean, I'm making that analogy because it's, it's closely tied to what Dirac did with fermions. And the coupling of the two is, is very much related. Um, then you go on to ask about local gauge phases and internal fermionic stuff. That gets into enough detail that I think I should probably leave it for now. Um, although it's really quite fun to think about what putting a fermion inside the cat tetrahedron does. Uh, and, and it's a place where you could start thinking about these questions about phases that you're asking. Um, Ahmed has three questions. Uh, the first is when you introduced the Ashton 
car variable as a surface integral, shouldn't it be a closed loop integral? Um, Ahmed, you can do it uh, either way. Um, if you want to get the full Gauss law, like I showed for the Newtonian gravitational field, you would want to integrate the Ashtakar electric field over a closed surface. But part of what I'm telling you is you don't have to do that. Uh, you can integrate over an open surface, like one of the triangular faces of our tetrahedron. And when you do that, you just get a finite oriented result. The, the orientation is the vector orientation, and the magnitude is the, the area of that surface. So the Ashtakar electric field is, is more flexible than only treating closed surfaces. Um, you can use divergence theorem to manipulate these integrals, um, although we are formulating things in terms of two forms, and even better is the, the Stokes theorem version of form stuff. You can do all of that thing, the sort of thing with the, the electric two form. Second question, what is the wedge product integral equivalent to? Is it similar to the curl theorem? Ah, good. Uh, yes, very similar to the curl theorem. So uh, that's what I was just saying about Stokes theorem. If you apply uh, Stokes theorem to the electric two form, you're gonna you're gonna convert between surface integrals and the line integrals around their boundaries. And the third question is why a tetrahedron? Is the most general case? Is that the most general case for a geometry? A uh, really good question, and I was going to leave this for later, but since you're asking it, I'll, I'll address it now. Um, a tetrahedron is by no means the most general thing. We're talking about the classical theory right now, and you could treat any surface whatsoever. The advantage of thinking about a tetrahedron is that you're no longer thinking about all of the degrees of freedom, the infinite number of degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. You've simplified your metrical geometry down to just describing the shape of the tetrahedron. So I, I did it quickly and didn't emphasize it, but what I'm doing is cutting down the number of degrees of freedom of the gravitational field from an infinite number to just those ones that describe the shape of the tetrahedron and by doing that, I'm making it into a finite degree of freedom system. That's what makes it like the CAT models we were using. And that's what makes it so much more accessible as a place to start out. Of course, we want to think about more and more degrees of freedom. And as you do that, one way to do that is to think about more and more complex or uh, convex polyhedra. So you could think of a dodecahedron, or you don't need to think of any kind of regular solid. You could think of any uh, polyhedron with any number of faces. If you want to use the, the Minkowski theorem, you need convexity. But, um, but what we're saying is that the Ashtakar electric two form is much more general and flexible than that. All right, those were the ones in the Q&A. There's some in the chat also, maybe. Um, Damodar is asking, or is this a question? Use of differential forms in Kaluza Klein theory. Ah, uh, no, nice it was a different conversation. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. That's great for everybody. Were there any other questions? I don't think so. I think you can continue. Okay, great. All right. So I had uh, given you the context for the ADM formalism, and now we actually want to do the ADM formalism. Um, the idea, as we said, was to make a space-time split, and you can use anything to give this foliation into space-like slices. So you could take a scalar field on your, uh, on your space-time that you were interested in and set the scalar field equal to constant, and that might pick out a spatial slice, for example. And so you could just look at constant values of that scalar field as a way to create this foliation. Um, but really, right now, aside from making it space-like, which I'm going to restrict attention to just for simplicity, there's no restriction on the, the foliation. Um, however, the geometry of the foliation does make some, for something interesting. So uh, we pick coordinates on our, our spatial slices, 
And uh, very naturally, you know, the coordinate at time t and the same coordinate at some later time t plus dt will not necessarily sit directly over our initial point. That is, the following our um, coordinate time t uh, gives a vector that moves both in the spatial slice and normal to the spatial slice. And it's usual, useful to keep track of those two motions. So um, we're going to call the, the one form which generates the normal to sigma t, uh, we're going to call it little n. It's a one form which is made up of uh, dt. That's because we're building it out of our coordinate time. And uh, a factor in front that we call the lapse uh, which tells me um, locally how much I have to multiply my, uh, my normal vector by to get up to the next slice, okay? And our normal vector, well, we're assuming this is space-like slice, so these normal vectors are, uh, are time-like. You could think of them as, um, as the sort of four, vec uh, four velocity of observers that are flowing perpendicular to your foliation. The point of this whole construction is that uh, once you've specified this normal structure, you can find all of the pieces of the metric on the slice and the piece of the metric perpendicular to the slice, normal to the slice. So in particular, we define the spatial metric as the space-time metric uh, plus these norm, the product, the outer product of these two uh, normal vectors. Uh, so this is the induced metric on one of our spatial slices. And similarly, you can talk about the extrinsic curvature. Uh, sometimes we blur the line between different kinds of a cur curvature. The extrinsic curvature is if you look at the normal vector to your foliation and you ask how it moves under parallel transport, under parallel transport, it might not agree with the normal that's at that new point. And the extrinsic curvature is a measure of how much you, uh, you have to rotate from one to the other. So um, the reason we blur them is that it's much easier for us to picture extrinsic curvature than intrinsic curvature. But all of you know from, from your GR courses that you don't have to look at normals to your surface to get at the intrinsic curvature. So K is different from the Ricci scalar Riemann tensor calculations we do uh, intrinsically on our surfaces. Okay, and uh, the last thing I want to mention is that these induced structures that were induced by our foliation give rise to uh, extrinsic curvature in the spatial indices. So I was writing the space-time indices because I was saying how these were constructed but now we can ask about the spatial piece. And it turns out the, the spatial piece is related to how the spatial metric changes in time and the covariant derivative of this other factor, nb, which is what we call the shift. So the shift is how much you had to move over uh, to get to the point that's gonna be under the next slice. So lapse is the, the proper time separation. Uh, and shift is the um, is the amount you have to shift. Uh, D here is the spatial covariant derivative. All right, so we've figured out a way uh, to construct the extrinsic curvature of this slice. Why are we doing that? Well, because we're going to make this space-time split. So we're going to take the Ricci scalar of the Einstein-Hilbert action, and we're going to figure out what it is on the spatial slice. And it turns out to break into three nice pieces. So the first piece is just the intrinsic curvature of the spatial slice. So R of G is the four-dimensional Ricci scalar. R of Q is the three-dimensional Ricci scalar, plus a term which is ex essentially the extrinsic curvature. Uh, it's adjusted by uh, its trace, essentially, it's trace squared. Um, and then uh, there's one more piece, but this last piece is a total derivative. 
And since I decided to think about the case without boundary, this total derivative becomes a boundary term and you can just ignore it for, for my discussion. So uh, the induced Ricci scalar is just a combination of these pieces. Um, just to make it one step more concrete, the space-time metric you can break up in these ways. So we saw that on the spatial slice, it, it just reduces to the spatial metric. But there are these mixed terms that come from the, the lapse and shift. And, uh, and the time-time component is a combination of the lapse and the shift. And the time-space components are, um, are adjustments of the spatial metric. So in particular, what this means is if you're lowering indices on the spatial slice, you can use uh, Q. But if you're raising indices on the spatial slice, you have to be careful. There are these off-diagonal pieces that contribute the, the shift. All right, so what am I doing? I'm making the space-time split. I've essentially achieved that now. And having made a space-time split, uh, we can, uh, we can ask for the canonically conjugate momentum to our variable. Our variable is the spatial metric QAB. And uh, I showed you just a moment ago that K becomes Q dot and this covariant derivative. So now we can see where Q dot shows up in our Lagrangian and we can compute the conjugate momentum. So please don't think I'm uh, imagining you can follow all the calculational steps here. I'm just trying to outline the process. Uh, at any rate, that calculation, what it gives us is, ah, you see now why I put a tilde on this conjugate momentum. It's a densitized, a root Q times the uh, extrinsic curvature. And once again, it's been trace uh, corrected. So we are subtracting out the trace of the extrinsic curvature. So, Having identified the conjugate momentum, we can now put the, our variable Q and its conjugate momentum into the action and organize the action around those variables. And this is a very interesting thing to do because we see the analog of PQ dot, which you remember was determining the symplectic structure. And it turns out that this is a constrained theory. Uh, so why do I mean that, what do I mean that there's a constraint? Well, these variables, the lapse and shift, they don't come with any time derivatives. So in fact, they act like Lagrange multipliers in this action, and they're going to impose two constraints, the vanishing of S tilde and the vanishing of C tilde A. So one of the jobs that you have to do when you do these canonical analyses is you have to figure out what the meaning of these two constraints is. So that's what my next slide is about. All right. Before I tell you about the meaning, let's just uh, look at the Poisson structure that's arisen. We saw that it was pi q dot that was showing up. That means that our Poisson bracket is going to take uh, q and pi as our conjugate variables. And, uh, and this is the, the Poisson structure. So we've completed the sort of phase space analysis of ADM, of this foliation. Um, as I was just mentioning, the lapse and shift end up being uh, Lagrange multipliers. And we can look at what their constraints they're imposing are. So they're imposing the vanishing of CA. CA is the covariant spatial derivative of the pi. And it turns out that this can be interpreted as uh, spatial diffeomorphisms. That's maybe not so surprising in retrospect. You remember the lapse, uh, sorry, the shift was the thing that moved you along the spatial slice. So this is imposing spatial diffeomorphism invariance. That is, we can change coordinates however we want along our foliation surfaces, and the theory should remain the same. This is Einstein's coordinate invariance. On the other hand, this S is what we call the scalar or Hamiltonian constraint. And, um, and it's this rather rich and complex uh, combination of the pi's and the three-dimensional uh, Ricci scalar. So again, to try to build some of your intuition, uh, we can compare what we've just done to electromagnetism. 
where you probably remember the Lagrangian goes like the field strength squared. And when you decompose that in terms of your variables, you get a piece, which is the electric field uh, contracted with your uh, potential one form dot plus an A0, this has no dot, this acts as a Lagrange multiplier, and that Lagrange multiplier imposes the vanishing covariant derivative of your electric field vector. That's Gauss's law right there. This comparison is useful in another way. Um, after we impose the constraints, that is, after we go onto the constraint surface, you see that this still has something left. There's an E squared plus B squared term in there, and that's the Hamiltonian of your theory. Compare that to the ADM situation. We have two Lagrange multipliers. They impose two constraints. Once you've gone onto the constraint service and made these two quantities vanish, nothing's left. You only have the kinematical structure left. There's no Hamiltonian. In retrospect, this probably isn't so surprising. The time that we used to describe this problem was an arbitrary coordinate time. Hamiltonians are supposed to generate time evolution. They're supposed to give you the flow on your phase space, but this was an arbitrary time coordinate, arbitrary choice. There was no physics in this choice. So the scalar uh, constraint, what it's doing is imposing time reparameterization invariance and we're losing the, the Hamiltonian of the theory as we do that. It's okay if we used a physical time, some sort of scalar field or uh, something like that, then we would be able to understand what we meant by evolution. It's evolution with respect to that physical field. All right, so this gives you uh, an outline of the process of finding uh, Canonical, canonically conjugate variables in a field theory like GR. It shows you how it works out in the ADM case. And there's just one or two more things to say about ADM that'll help you understand what's coming next. So a key challenge for gravity is the following. Uh, you'd like for the algebra of your constraints, so when you compute Poisson brackets of your constraints, you'd like for those to give the same structure as the algebra of your gauge group. Unfortunately, this isn't quite true in ADM, and it's not quite true in most of the current approaches to, to general relativity. So um, in computing Poisson brackets of constraints, it's very convenient to smear them. That is, you pick some function f, and you integrate the constraint against that function, and that gives you a smeared version of the constraint. These are just easier to compute the Poisson brackets between. So the smeared scalar constraint works this way. The smeared uh, vector constraint works this way. Once you've done that, you can compute their Poisson brackets. I'm just going to report them to you so you can see the structure. And uh, nicely, the spatial diffios close. So if you compute smeared C with F and with G, you get the smearing of C with the Lie derivative of G with respect to F. And that's exactly how diffeomorphisms act. And so this is consistently giving you spatial diffeomorphisms. If you compute the scalar constraint with the vector constraint, um, what happens is, again, you get the scalar constraint closes nicely, and you get the Lie derivative of the scalar smearing function with respect to the vector smearing function, and that's, again, how diffios act, and it's perfectly good. Unfortunately, <laughs> the scalar constraint with the scalar constraint does give you something that looks like the vector constraint, but it's not the way that the diffios should act between these guys. Instead of just being related to the scalars smearings, f and g, it's got the spatial metric in it. This would be like if you had a Lie algebra and you were cal calculating Lie algebra brackets and your structure constants depended on where you were in the group. They wouldn't be structure constants, they would be structure functions, and that's what's happening here. Your, your, smear, your, your Poisson bracket of your constraints is depending on the metric that you're at. 
Um, here, just notationally, this D is like in Klein-Gordon theory. It's um, F D of G minus uh, G D of F. That's what it means. So um, because of this last Q dependence, this is not the, the standard Lie algebra of the diffeomorphism group. Uh, it turns out this is what's called the Lie algebroid. Um, and Alan Weinstein, who was at who's a professor at Berkeley and uh, who I um, chatted with a bit when I was there, uh, has worked a lot on trying to understand this Lie algebraid way of thinking about GR, but it's not something I've, I've thought about deeply, but you should check out his work if you're interested. So it's this that kind of makes this uh, tricky gauge theory. Um, so failure to close is concerning for quantization, right? Uh, when we when we try to quantize a Poisson bracket, we try to turn these into operators that represent the algebra still, the algebra of your gauge group, for example. Uh, and we'd like the the algebra of constraints to to annihilate our physical states. And the fact that this doesn't close into an algebra means that that's going to be a harder process. And this is one of the key challenges of quantum gravity. So. Um, if I zoom out, I've been telling you a bit about the algebra of the constraints, but if I zoom out and I look at the brackets between uh, field variables and the constraints, um, one way of characterizing why ADM in particular is a hard theory is that you get very complicated functions. Uh, Q with C gives you a very complicated function of the, the Q and the pi's. So, um, so this is a hard thing to work with. Uh, Dirac looked at this and he called it the hypersurface deformation algebra. And it turns out that on solutions to the Einstein equations, it does form an algebra, but it's very subtle. And uh, it's not at all clear when you go to quantum mechanics where you're leaving the, you're going off shell, right? You're leaving the solutions of the equations of motion. It's not at all clear that this is gonna be easy to work with. So um, this is one of the challenges of quantizing ADM theory directly. Um, so I've been giving you exercises throughout. I called this long exercise four <laughs> because I skipped like a million details in that whole discussion. And so I'm just encouraging you to go back through and fill in those details. That's probably more of a research project than an exercise. Um, but the, the, I, I also put citations here to the initial ADM papers. They're really quite nice. And if you've never looked at them, uh, these are, are hyperlinked and you can just click on the slides once they're posted and take a look at the ADM papers. They are really good foundational papers to understand what's going on in, in quantum gravity. All right. So that's my discussion of ADM. That was all a warm up for doing the same in Ashtakar variables. So um, to go to Ashtakar variables, I need to tell you about a couple more connections. So I called this slide connections, connections, connections. <laughs> um, uh, I'll try to sort out all the pieces here for you, but, uh, but it is a little bit, um, takes a minute to get uh, a handle on all the pieces that are going on here. So the way that I want to show you the Ashtakar connection is to start from the ADM variables, which we already have a handle on the, con the canonical conju conjugacy of those variables, and I'm going to perform a canonical transformation. So I'm going to go to another set of canonical variables where I'm building on the ones that we've just seen. Um, to see how this works, it's really helpful to know what the spin connection is and, and have a little bit of intuition for the spin connection. So for the next couple of slides, let me go back to the space-time context. I'll leave this spatial foliation and, and we'll think about space-time. Uh, you all know well how the covariant derivative uh, on the space-time vectors works. Uh, the covariant derivative can be expressed in terms of the coordinate derivative and a connection. Uh, and in particular, we often uh, concentrate on the case of a levi chivita connection, which is a connection that satisfies two additional properties. 
um, it satisfies metric compatibility. So this is the condition that the covariant derivative of the metric is zero and it's torsion free, which ends up being an algebraic constraint on the levi civita connection, which says that the anti-symmetrization of its lower indices vanishes. So to have a levi civita connection, you need uh, the lower indices to be symmetric. Um, there's a number of reasons to think about levi civita I mean, uh, one that uh, is nice is if you take your manifold and you embed it in a higher dimensional Euclidean space, uh, this is the connection that really is just parallel transport in that Euclidean space and then projection back onto the manifold that you're working on. All right. But we've been noticing that we don't have just one kind of vectors around. Uh, we also have the Lorentz frame that we want to be able to parallel transport its vectors. In other words, I want to be able to parallel transport vectors with internal indices. And this is where the idea of, um, of a spin connection comes from. Uh, the spin connection is the thing that allows you to transport internal vectors. So I'm sorry, the Ds and Noblas are proliferating. Uh, the curly D here is uh, the, the name I'm going to give to the uh, spin uh, covariant derivative. So it turns out that the way to kind of define what you mean by a spin covariant derivative, and it's a really nice idea, is you just take your internal vector and you use the tetrad to re-express it as a space-time vector. And the covariant derivative is just the uh, tetrad contraction of the space-time covariant derivative. So these two are, uh, are the requirement that we make. This, this equation is the requirement that we make to define the spin connection covariant derivative. As with any covariant derivative, you can write it as a connection. Uh, so here's the, the second equality here is just stating what that connection uh, looks like, our, our, my convention for that connection. So it's again just the usual coordinate derivative of the vector, but now our connection is going to carry two internal indices so that it properly can contract with the internal index and return uh, something that you can add to this uh, space-time derivative. So uh, omega is what we call the spin connection. Um, so this formula that I wrote at the top line here is general. It works for any uh, covariant derivative. But in particular, if we'd like our spin connection to be the one that corresponds to the levi civita connection, then we have to impose some constraints on our spin connection. That's not no surprise. And they, they're basically just translations of metric compatibility and torsion freeness. So metric compatibility looks like metric compatibility of the internal metric. In other words, uh, the covariant derivative an annihilates the Minkowski metric. And if you translate what that means, it means that the upper indices of the spin connection um, the, are anti-symmetric. The symmetric part vanishes. Um, on the other hand, we can bundle the tetrad into a tetrad one form as we had before, and we can define what we call the covariant exterior derivative. It's just defined as the exterior derivative of that one form plus the omega one form, that is omega ij contracted with dx mu. The omega one form uh, wedged the, the tetrad one form and uh, torsion freeness you can check amounts to the requirement that this uh, covariant exterior derivative vanishes. All right, so that sets the stage, the definitions for what we're talking about. Um, but I want to I want to work on this space-time split because I want to introduce Ashtagar variables. So to do that, what we do is we decompose uh, the spin connection into two parts. I'll work with the spin connection one form just because it's a little easier to look at fewer indices. So the zero i components, remember this thing is anti-symmetric, so I, I have no zero zero component. The zero i components are the components that boost. If I take a, an internal vector of one point of space-time to another, this omega zero i tells me how to boost from one to the other. 
but the omega ij connection uh, tells you the spatial rotation. So it's the spatial piece that we're interested in. And uh, just as we did on space-time, we can introduce a levi civita tensor on the internal space, and it's going to turn out to be convenient to, uh, to re-encode the, the double indices of the spin connection, the spatial part of the spin connection, into a single index using this uh, levi civita tensor. So I'll call capital gamma IA, uh, intentionally making it look a little bit more like the connection you're used to in space-time, but, uh, but it is, of course, a spatial version of this, and it's coming from the spin connection. Uh, so it's defined this way. Um, and just as the uh, space-time spin connection is determined by the tetrad once you impose metric compatibility and torsion freeness, this spatial uh, spin connection is determined by the spatial triad. So that's the, the structure of what we're looking at. All right, so a lot of definitions, but let's see how they fit together. So uh, recall what the definition of our triad was. It decomposes the metric into internal space. And uh, one more definition, we're going to take the single index extrinsic curvature just to be the contraction of the spatial intrinsic curvature with the triad. And when you do this, we're just plugging in all the definitions we just made into the ADM Lagrangian, because we knew the canonical structure of the ADM Lagrangian. When you plug in all those definitions, you remember I was able to express pi in terms of the k's, and we want q dot, but q dot is just the time derivative of this thing. And so that's going to give us a factor of two, because there's two factors of the triad, uh, e dot with e. OK. So this is the thing we want to understand. Well, I want to, and this is just a choice, I want to think about uh, the triad as the momentum variable. And because I want to do that, I'm going to use, once again, integration by parts to move this time derivative off of the triad and onto the k. Aside from that, I'm just working out what the contractions mean here. The root Q goes into the E to become an E tilde. The, the exchange of the derivative and the contraction with the E uh, gives me the K in this definition. And of course, because I did integration by parts, I have a boundary term that I'm just going to ignore. I'm not even going to calculate it for you because I don't want to distract you with it. All right, at this point, I think we're in good shape to kind of summarize what's going on. ADM taught us that the metric, very schematically, no indices. The metric and this pi were canonically conjugate. The metric commuted with itself, pi commuted with itself. So by this change of variables, what we're recognizing is the triad is canonically conjugate to the, the um, extrinsic curvature. So what we're going to get as our variables then is the extrinsic curvature with the triad. The extrinsic curvature, it's not hard to check, commutes with itself, and E commutes with itself. And so we have a nice canonically conjugate pair here to work with. All right, that would be great, except the problem is that K is not a connection. K is the extrinsic curvature. It turns out it's a vector field. It's, uh, it's related to the components of the boost part of the connection. But the boost part, if you think of the Lie algebra, Poisson bracket of boost with boost doesn't close into boosts. It goes into rotations. So k is not a good um, connection variable. So, uh, however, there's a really neat trick, which is that connections uh, have a ambiguity in their definition. You can add a vector to a connection, and you still get a connection. So what Ashtakar did, and it was a really interesting idea, was to define a new connection, which is simply the spin connection related to the triad that we had a moment ago, together added to the k that we just defined and just realized was canonically conjugate to the e. By doing this, you know, gamma is determined by E. 
and we know that E commutes. So this term doesn't contribute to the Poisson bracket at all. And we get that this A will be canonically conjugate to E because K is canonically conjugate to E. But at the same time as getting the canonical conjugacy, we're also getting uh, a connection, a true connection out of this change of variables. So, uh, so this is a really beautiful idea, which is to, to reorganize your variables uh, in this way. Um, Ashtakar's original choice was to make the, the number, it turns out you can always do a scalar times the vector that you're adding to your connection. He, his original choice was to make uh, that number the complex unit, square root of minus one. So this was the, the beautiful idea of Ashtakar's new variables. Um, there's a reason he chose I here, and let me just say this very briefly. Um, it makes the, uh, this original choice of the Ashtakar connection a complex variable, and there's a, a nice reason to do that. I mentioned to you a moment ago that the extrinsic curvature is the boost part of the spin connection, and uh, when you take uh, these two parts of the connection and you combine them with a complex I, then the Lorentz group has a very nice decomposition over those complex numbers. SL2C, which is one way of uh, representing the Lorentz group, SL2C decomposes into a direct sum of um, complexified SU2 with complexified SU2. And these, this decomposition is into what's called the self-dual and the anti-self-dual part. And so Ashtakar's choice was picking out exactly the self-dual part of this connection. And uh, by doing that, he was um, getting a nice connection on a nice compact, well, it's not compact because it's complexified, but on a nice gauge group that he understood exactly what was going on. The price he was paying was that he was using complex variables. And at the level of the classical theory, that causes no problem at all. It's easy to understand how to extract the two parts of that complex variable and reconstruct uh, standard GR from the parts. Unfortunately, in the quantum theory so far, nobody has uh, found a good way, a good scheme to turn these things into operators and yet also be able to extract the real and imaginary parts of those operators. And so um, the initial choice of Ashtakar variables has failed so far. Hopefully one of you will sort this out because I think this would be the most beautiful way to go. Uh, it's failed on the, on the basis of this reality condition. So what do people do instead? Uh, the most common thing is to not use an I. Instead, insert a general scalar here uh, that is a real number. By using a, a real number, this becomes a real connection variable, and we're studying GR in real variables. Um, the freedom to use any scalar here was first uh, appreciated by Fernando Barbero and Giorgio Mirzi, and so the parameter is called the Barbero and Mirzi parameter. And it's a new uh, free parameter of, of loop quantum gravity. It's not in uh, standard general relativity. It's coming from this canonical transformation that we're making on our phase space variables. However, it does have a very uh, nice physical meaning. And I will, I will tell you in just a moment what that meaning is. But let me try to sum up where we are with these Ashtakar variables. So uh, if we use the Ashtakar Barbero connection, then remarkably we have uh, almost everything we wanted. We have uh, a nice set of canonically conjugate variables, the Ashtakar electric field and the Ashtakar Barbero connection. They satisfy these commutation relations. You see the Barbero and Mertzi parameter shows up in there. And one of the things that's really quite nice about this choice of variables is that the connection commutes, Poisson commutes with itself. So we get what we would hope for in a phase space, and we've done it as a gauge theory because A is a connection.
unfortunately, there's a tension and it's a real tension in the theory. And it's one that I hope, as I said, one of you will sort out. We have to choose two amongst the following three things. <laughs> we have to either have um, real variables that we have better idea how to quantize uh, and a Poisson commuting connection. But when we adopt this choice, this is the Ashtagar Barbero choice, it turns out that the surface deformation algebra issue that we saw before is still there and is nasty. So if we choose those two things, we pay in space-time covariance. The foliation algebra is, is hard to deal with. Or we can choose complex variables, give up on one, and we get nice still Poisson commuting Ashtakarj connection. And the space-time uh, foliation algebra simplifies substantially, it becomes quite beautiful. I'll show it on the next slide. But the trouble is we don't know how to impose reality conditions at the quantum level. Turns out there's a third option. I won't go through it right now, but it's the option where you, um, you give up on Poisson commuting uh, variables and you work with a connection that satisfies one and three. All right, so here it is. We spent a lot of time today trying to construct this thing. <laughs> so I best, uh, best show it to you. It's the Einstein-Hilbert action written in Ashtakar Barbero variables, or here I've written it in Ashtakar variables, I should say, without, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm mixing things a little. I put gamma in the action, but I wrote you the constraint algebra for the Ashtakar connection. Uh, so you see that it has the standard non-abelian gauge theory term. It has, interestingly, a Gauss constraint. This is exactly what I was describing for you at the beginning of today's talk in the case of the simplified tetrahedral model. But this is uh, the electric flux uh, constraint. You can see it here. Uh, it has the lapse times the scalar constraint and the shift times the spatial diffeos. And one of the beautiful things about the Ashtakar variables, it's what I was mentioning to you was a flaw of the ADM variables, is that everything in sight is a simple polynomial of your phase space variables. Look at these constraint um, conditions. There's E and there's the field strength, which is at most quadratic in A. So we have something that's at most cubic. And then similarly, the scalar constraint, it's E and so this is quadratic in E and quadratic in A. There's a beautiful uh, change of variables that makes the, the theory as close to a polynomial theory as I've ever seen GR. Um, as I said, the weakness of this particular formulation with these variables is the, the reality condition, but people continue to think about it. All right, that is finally our summary of general relativity as a gauge theory. We've seen the connection and the electric variable. And uh, the last part of today is quite brief and far less technical. So if you're exhausted, you get to relax a little now. Um, I want to tell you a bit about quantum mechanics. So far, we've done no quantum theory. We've just set up the quantization. So I want to go back to our tetrahedral cat and quantize that system as a beginning of quantizing gravity. And then I'll tell you just very briefly today what spin networks are, and we'll take them up more in detail next time. All right, you remember our tetrahedral system? It was the, the four electric flux vectors integrated on the faces of this tetrahedron add up to zero. Um, as we've seen, each of these fluxes can be thought of as an angular momentum vector, a generator of rotations, element of the dual of the Lie algebra of SU2. As such, well, we know how to quantize angular momenta. That's the, the, one of the first systems we learn in quantum mechanics. So let's let our Hilbert space be a carrier space of a SU2 ARF. In other words, let's let it have a basis, which is just the standard JM basis of an angular momentum. Well, then these are the angular momentum vectors, which we can turn into operators that act on this basis. And we even know how e squared would be j times j plus one, or if I just think of it as the norm, e acting on this state gives me the square root of j times j plus one. 
Of course, E carries physical units, and so this comes with physical units, and we've seen already that the units are areas. So the electric flux gives us a quantum of area, and it's labeled by an SU2 spin label, in other words, a half integer, um, and, uh, and it's multiplied by the Planck area. So the quantization that we're encountering here is the areas come in finite steps. In fact, this is where the physical interpretation of the barbaro mietzi parameter comes in. It sets the scale of the gaps between one quantum of area and the next. So the Planck area sets the physical scale, but gamma tunes how big that gap is. So this is the meaning of that parameter in the theory. If <laughs> in some wonderful fashion we could measure Planck scale discreteness of space-time, we could directly uh, probe this spectrum and we would uh, have an empirical answer for the value of gamma. Uh, but as I mentioned to you in the first lecture, that scale is so tiny that we uh, have no good idea of how to probe it as of yet, and gamma remains a free parameter in the theory. So this is the first step of the quantization to treat electric fluxes as angular momenta and, and quantize them in this fashion. We can say more though. You see that that JM quantum state carries a magnetic quantum number, but that tells you that there's some sort of orientation dependence in that quantum state, right? Uh, the uh, magnetic quantum number is about the Z component of the angular momentum. And that makes sense for individual facets that they might have a Z component, but we know that the full tetrahedron had best have angular momenta that add up to zero, hence no orientation dependence. And so there must be a way to search for states that are rotationally invariant. And the way that we do this at the quantum mechanical level is we look for, we take the tensor product of the SU2 irreps of each of these uh, variables. And within that tensor product space, we look for the rotationally invariant states. So in of this Hilbert space means the, the the subspace of this Hilbert space that's rotationally invariant, and we look for what we call intertwiners. These are states in that invariant subspace. Um, just to be a little bit more explicit, because this can be hard to think about when you first encounter it, what we mean by an intertwiner state is, well, it's got a label, a quantum label I, it's got, of course, the, the area labels we already mentioned. So this I is just shorthand for this whole state. And it's defined as some rotationally invariant tensor contracted with the JM states to give you a rotationally invariant state. So that's a way of thinking about what we're doing here. And by doing this, we've started to build up the quantization of this whole tetrahedral grain, this whole grain of space. Um, I just defined for you what an intertwiner, intertwiner was abstractly, but I haven't actually given you an example of such a state yet. So uh, this is why I had you do, or I'm asking you to do that first exercise that shows that the volume is given by the trickle product of the flux vectors, volume squared. Um, what's interesting about this is that this triple product is clearly a rotational invariant. So if we were to able to write down a volume operator, a hat of the volume, then its uh, eigenvalues and its eigenstates would be rotationally invariant states and would furnish us with a first example of an intertwiner state. It would be a state whose quantum labels are the volume and the spin labels that tell you the areas of the four faces of the tetrahedron. Um, this works. Uh, and has been studied in loop quantum gravity extensively, and I can give you lots of references. Um, but it, it would take me a little bit far afield to show you exactly what this volume operator is right at the moment. So uh, uh, I'll leave that aside for now and just say that you can do this. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to display it for you is that there's something really interesting going on here. If you think about a classical tetrahedron, how would you specify it? Well, there's lots of different ways you could, but one way that you could is you could specify the six edge lengths of its six edges. 
And once you've specified those values, you've all but uniquely determined the tetrahedron. I guess it could be a finite set of tetrahedra. You could reflect the one vertex through the base and you get another tetrahedron with the same edge lengths. But up to that finite degeneracy, you would have completely specified the tetrahedron. But look at these quantum labels here. We only have five quantum labels. And so we have fewer parameters than you did in the classical theory with six edge lengths. That means that this is not completely classically specified. That's not surprising. This is a quantum mechanical system. You should have some analog, geometrical analog of Heisenberg uncertainty. And so this should be a fuzzy tetrahedron. So uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a little bit more today and more next time about the Dis the prediction of discreteness of geometry and loop quantum gravity, but I don't want you to get too tied to thinking of the grains, the tetrahedral grains that I describe as really being literally that space time is made of tetrahedra. What we mean is it's made of quantum tetrahedra or quantum grains, and you could use other basis states as well, but let's take these for a moment, and those have fuzzy geometry. Right? They're spread out over classical states in the same way that an energy eigenstate of the harmonic oscillator is spread out over the, all the classically allowed en uh, phase space points with that energy. So this is the sense of discreteness that we have in mind. It's really a spectral discreteness. If I measure the volume, I get an eigenvalue of the volume. If I measure the area, I get an eigenvalue of the area. I don't mean that there's literally little um, pie pieces of space-time that what things are cut up into. All right, that's what I wanted to say about the tetrahedron, and timing is pretty good. I will tell you a few minutes about spin networks, and then uh, I'll have some time to answer questions. So uh, the spin network is a beautiful idea, and uh, here again I'm stealing from Simone Speziale's beautiful way of presenting this. Um, what he points out is that uh, over the course of the presentation of the ADM variables and the Ashtakar variables, we've come to understand that GR is a gauge theory, but it's an unusual one. It's a gauge theory that has a gigantic gauge group. The gauge group is not just these local changes of inertial frame that we first were thinking about, but also the diffeomorphisms, the changes of coordinates of our manifold. And that diffeomorphism group is infinite dimensional, and it's got that at every point of space time. So it's this huge gauge symmetry. And uh, that causes real problems for understanding observables in the theory. Uh, let's take just an intuitive one that you may have encountered before, a scalar field. When you do any kind of transformation in a standard theory, rotation of three-dimensional space of a scalar field, it doesn't change the scalar field. That's why it's a scalar. But if we do a diffeomorphism, well, we're changing coordinates, and the value of the scalar field will be the value at the new coordinate point, which may be different from what it was before. So this is confusing at first, but it has good meaning. It has clear physical meaning. Uh, the coordinates don't mean anything. <laughs> coordinates are just labels for points in space-time. So the way that you have to specify a scalar field to get a good notion of its value is you have to specify it with respect to some other physical observable. If I want the temperature at the corner of my blackboard, well, I can't say it's the temperature at 0, 0, 0 in my coordinates because I do a diffeomorphism, the coordinates move all around. But saying that it's at the corner of my blackboard, that's specifying a physical thing. It's the temperature relative to the positions of the particles of the blackboard. And as such, it has well-defined meaning even after I make the diffio. So, uh, so observables in general relativity are, are relative observables. You have to relate one physical quantity to another physical quantity. Um, another aspect of this challenge <laughs> is that uh, GR is naturally related to geometry, and we would want to specify observables, say, by talking about geometries. Uh, 
but diffeomorphisms mess that up too. <laughs> If you can perform an arbitrary smooth diffeomorphism, you can easily deform this sort of square-like thing into a circle. So these are the same geometry under the diffeo, and I can't distinguish them. So I, I have to find a way out of dealing with that. Well, one, one way out is to just allow to slightly more complex geometries. So for example, if I take this graph that has two vertices as well as the edges, this has non-trivial topology compared to this. You know, right? There's two cycles on this thing, not just the one cycle of this. And so that non-trivial topology helps us to distinguish these. And furthermore, there are kind of kinks at the vertices here, and a smooth diffio can't get rid of those kinks. And so that's going to be preserved uh, under a diffio. Or if you're working in three-dimensional uh, space, you could have paths, say, that you're computing the parallel transport along that are knotted. And that knotting, you can't get rid of by a smooth diffio. You can't push edges through edges by a smooth diffio. So it's very um, hard to find good observables in GR. Uh, but there is this interesting facet that we can distinguish some things. All right. On the other hand, let's ask the same questions in a gauge theory. What are the good observables in a gauge theory? And in an abelian gauge theory, you have the, the field strength that we were talking about, and that's a nice one that you're used to. It's because we, it's local. You measure E and B here, and you know exactly what you're talking about. So that's one option in abelian theory. Another theory, if you're studying, for example, electromagnetic waves where the E and B are mixing up, it's often nice to go to a traceless vector potential. And it turns out this is a, this is a well-defined projector onto the traceless piece, and you can really uh, think about the, the traceless modes, the transverse traceless modes of, the, of your field. Um, so, uh, so that's another option in your abelian theory. Uh, or you can calculate, as we were with the cat, you can calculate uh, loop integrals of your potential one form. And uh, in, in the abelian theory like e &M, we know that the gauge freedom is uh, addition of an exact form, and the integral of an exact form over a closed loop vanishes. And so this is gauge invariant, and we have a good observable we can work with. On the non-abelian side, things get a bit more complicated. Uh, F actually transforms under gauge transformations, and so it's much harder to get at uh, the local gauge field directly. You can form traces of F, but it, it's a more complicated object. You can still form transverse traceless things, um, but uh, another option within a non-abelian theory that's the same as the abelian one is to compute what we call holonomies. These are exponentials of the integral of the potential one form. Turns out you there's a subtlety here in the non-abelian case. You have to do what's called path ordering. I'll introduce that next time. Um, but these holonomies, well, they transform nicely under the gauge group, uh, but I guess they still transform. But the last step, and this is what Wilson did, and you can do it in either the abelian or non-abelian case, you just form the trace of that for a loop. That is, we're going to integrate from x to x. And when you do that, the trace allows you to move this g over to the other side. They cancel, and you just get trace of h. So the Wilson loops are gauge invariants. Um, so these last two are very geometrical, very intuitive. It seems like they would be really nice variables for your gauge theory, observables for your gauge theory. So how come Wilson loops aren't the standard story? How come you didn't use Wilson loops all the time in e &M, for example? Well, the trouble with Wilson loops is they provide a huge set of observables. Because in a standard gauge theory, the curve that goes around like this in some spatial slice, say, and the curve, well, in, usually it would be in your gauge bundle, in your principal bundle. Um, and the one that goes around like this, these are distinguishable in the gauge theory. And so your Wilson loops provide this huge set. Uh, and so often you avoid these in the continuum. One place where you do use them all the time is in lattice gauge theory. 
because in lattice ga gauge theory, you have the discrete plaquettes and you can't deform a plaquette just a little bit. It's just the plaquette of the lattice. So you can integrate around one of those or around two of them or, and, and you get a, a nice countable set of uh, observables that you can work with. So we don't use Wilson loops as much as we might like because of this issue. Well, interestingly, there's a beautiful idea in, in loop quantum gravity and general relativity, which is that the two problems we were just observing kind of cancel each other out. In loop gravity, in gravity, you have a diffeomorphism that moves an edge, but that's not counted as a distinct state. So the Wilson loops associated with uh, a graph on a spatial slice actually are a reasonable set of observables because we're not going to distinguish between this curve and the curve with a little bit of a bump on it. That's just a diffio away. So those aren't distinct. So a spin network is um, a set of observables that we build up out of a graph embedded in the spatial picture we're talking about now, a graph embedded in your spatial slice, colored, each of its links colored by an irrep of SU2, that is by a spin label, that tells you how much flux is going across that link. So this is a dual picture where the flux is the surface area that is cr uh, being crossed by that link. And the nodes are related to these intertwiners I was just telling you about, and they tell you about the volume of the, the quantized volume of the region that you're thinking of. So you build up uh, little grains of space that are connected one to another via these flux uh, lines. All right, so more concretely, and this is the last slide and I'll stop, a spin network is a collection of intertwiners at each node with colored links representing flux irreps of SU2 connecting them. So you can think of the Hilbert space of your graph as the L2 space, the square integrable functions built out of SU2 gauge variables where you have uh, a gauge variable, an SU2 for each link and at each node, you divide by the, the gauge freedom of that node. This is the rotational freedom we were thinking of for the tetrahedra. And, and this is your Hilbert space associated with this graph. So the, the picture is, uh, shows you quite distinctly that connectivity is, a, is coming from these links, right? It tells us what part of space-time is near, uh, is, is adjacent on uh, another part of space-time. But there's no reference to a background geometry. There's no metric in the background that we're, we're referring to when we talk about these grains of space. They're, they are the, the field, the gravitational field itself that is building space time. So they, they're quantum mechanical spectra manifest space time. And uh, there was this important part, a question that came at the midway break that someone was asking me, are you really saying that tetrahedra are the, are the thing we're gonna describe? And I was saying, no, that's just one cutting down of the degrees of freedom of the gravitational freedom, uh, a field to one particular simple case. And the way this is in, uh, embodied in spin networks is that smaller graphs, gamma, can be built, uh, embedded or connect, um, built into larger graphs that have more nodes and links. And those larger graphs are capturing more degrees of freedom of the gravitational field. And so it's by this inclusion of smaller graphs and larger ones that you get to study the quantized gravitational field with more and more degrees of freedom. So that's the picture, those are the ideas. Uh, I'll talk about this much more concretely next time, and we'll build on that. Uh, for now, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the cat in the tetrahedron in quantum gravity. And, uh, and I know that it's right at the end of time. If you have to go, feel free, but I'm also happy to stick around and answer questions. Holly, um, Johanna had to leave early, so um, you, you can go ahead and answer the questions in the chat in, in okay, the Q&A. Yeah.
Um, uh, a technical question, Paikal asks, does uh, parentheses A, B on slide 23 mean symmetrization? Yes, it absolutely does. I'm so sorry I didn't can't say that at the time, uh, but that's exactly what it means. Uh, Idris asks, does the extrinsic curvature have a space-time component due to its definition as the space-time covariant derivative? If it does, uh, does the KAB in the induced extrinsic curvature on the spatial slice? Yes. Um, uh, yes to everything you said. Uh, so um, extrinsic curvature always has to refer to some submanifold embedded in your manifold because the curvature is with respect to that embedding. Um, so, but you, you can, uh, you can embed all sorts of slices. You could embed time-like slices as well as space-like ones and all sorts of things like that. And, uh, depending on how it's embedded, you'd get, uh, components of the extrinsic curvature in every index mu. Um, what we were doing was working on a spatial slice and inducing the extrinsic curvature from that spatial slice. And, uh, as such, it has only this. Um, spatial extrinsic curvature, and that's what K sub A B was talking about: is the the extrinsic curvature of that spatial slice as induced from the space time. Um, Deepan asks, will there be a change in the ADM formulation while considering a space time with black holes and their singularities? So. Um, the ADM formulation doesn't make reference to any particular solution of the Einstein equations. It's just a way to cast the theory in terms of variables. And as such, you can study any solution of Einstein's equations in those variables. In particular, you could, work, you could look for the Schwarzschild metric in the ADM variables, and you could find it, I'm sure. It's, uh, so. Um, so there's nothing special about black holes as far as that goes. Um, you're mentioning singularities, and of course, when you talk about singularities, uh, you're starting to get to the place where GR is no longer valid, and ADM is n just a formulation of GR. So ADM also fails at the singularities, uh, as any theory of GR does. So um, so yes, if you followed your spatial slices all the way in to the singularity, uh, you're going to get a breakdown in your ADM theory. Um, of course, there's the the sort of Kruskal extension of the Schwarzschild black hole, where um, where the singularity is sort of not very relevant <laughs> uh, because you've kind of universally extended the space time. And one thing that is very interesting about working in the triad variables, so this is moving away from ADM and towards Ashtakar variables, but one thing that's really interesting about working in those variables is there's nothing inconsistent about having the triad or tetrad vanish at a point of space-time. And as such, you can actually work with more singular space-times than you could work with in the, the metric formulation. So, uh, so if you work in a first order formulation, you actually can investigate things like Kruskal, where you go through, you extend the metric through a singularity, and you do it by just having the, the tetrad vanish at the singularity. So that, that is something that's very interesting and, and very compelling to a lot of quantum gravity people about working in the first order formalism. Uh, Faikal asks, uh, metricity is the same as metric compatibility? Yes. Uh, of course, different people use different terminology, so I should footnote that, but yes, usually it's the same thing. Uh, another question from Faikal, does the gamma measure the size of a space-time's degree of freedom? Um, no. Um, so when I say degree of freedom, I'm talking about, so let's take the tetrahedron for concreteness. I'm talking about the gauge invariant variables that are associated with that tetrahedron. 
So the gauge invariant variables would be things like the area of the facets and maybe the dihedral angles, the dot products between two of those area vectors. Um, those are all going to be gauge invariant. They don't care about orientation in space, right? They're going to be the same no matter how you orient the tetrahedron. So, um, so those, that number of degrees of freedom for the tetrahedron is fixed regardless of the value of gamma. What gamma does is tell you about measurements. If I was able to probe the Planck scale and I came and I measured the area of the tetrahedral facet, and then maybe I took another tetrahedral facet and I measured its area, you know, I would get the usual spectral spacing of quantum mechanics. And gamma would tell me about how far apart those spectral measurements were from one another. So it's not controlling how many aspects of the metric I can uh, probe when I study a tetrahedron. It's controlling how spread out the, the measurements themselves would be. I hope that's clear. Um, Deepan asks, does the diffeomorphism constraint correspond to space translation invariance? And could the conjugate momentum to the metric be the generator of the same? Could a Fourier space of the metric in the ADM formulation be hence formed? All right, um, let me go back. I think it'll be a little easier to answer that question actually looking at the slide. Um, let's do it in ADM since you're asking in ADM. Um, all right, so here are constraints. And here they are explicitly. So, um, so I have to be a little bit careful about whether we're talking in the space-time context or in the ADM context. In the ADM context, we've made the space-time split, and we're working on spatial slices. And this uh, spatial diffeo constraint is reparameterization, recoordinatization of that spatial slice. So that's what what we're talking about there. The scalar constraint you can think of as kind of being analogous to the time diffeomorphisms. It's the deformation of my hypersurface algebra. So I, I so of my hypersurface, excuse me. I've got some hypersurface and then I imagine going to another hypersurface. It's that kind of uh, diffeo, uh, change of coordinates to different slicings. Um, so, so that, I just wanted to clarify the point that the there's two different aspects of diffios that are showing up in this constraint algebra. Um, and then you're asking about the conjugate momentum to the metric, and could it be the generator of the same? So the conjugate variable in ADM is the extrinsic curvature, and we have since we studied ADM later, we understood that the extrinsic curvature uh, is related to the boost symmetries. So it's related to the, the internal symmetries that we're, when we go to a new frame in the, in the local Lorenz frame. Um, and then you're asking about Fourier space. And uh, yes, you can do a Fourier space sort of decomposition here. Uh, I, there's no no reason not to be able to do that kind of thing. Uh, okay, Davide asks, what is meant by area gaps defined by the Barber immediacy parameter? So I may have answered that in the previous question about this. Um, uh, I, I guess I wish I had made a picture. I could try and do it live, but I think I would make a mess. But uh, like I said, it's just like if you measure the energy of a harmonic oscillator, right? The spectrum would have discrete energy levels. Um, and the idea here is that area, when you measure the area of a surface in quantum gravity, it also has a discrete spectrum if it's a spatial surface. And that discrete spectrum has, has gaps between one measured value and the next measured value. And the immersity parameter controls how big those gaps are. That's what I mean by an area gap. All right, I 
I should let you all go soon, so I'll just answer one more question and we'll stop for today. Okay. Uh, Idris says, in the previous ADM formalism, if one instead starts with the formulation of GR from tetrad and spin connection and performs spacetime splitting, will we get the same structure as we have with the Ashtakar formulation? Beautiful question. Yes, you're exactly on to the second way to get Ashtakar variables. Uh, so Ashtakar variables, you can write down what's called the Holst action. It's a first order action for GR in terms of tetrad and spin connection. And uh, it has uh, a topological term built in, which is where the Barbarum immediacy parameter comes in. In fact, it's a Hodge dual. That, that would be fun for you all. Um, and then uh, when you make the space time, when you study that theory and then make the space time split, you recover the Ashtakar variables from a different route. In fact, that route is the route that makes it easiest to see that the, um, the boost part of the spin connection is related to the extrinsic curvature variable in ADM. I, I just made that claim. I didn't prove it for you all. And uh, that route makes it easiest to prove that. Uh, second question from Idris. The gamma that you add to the, the definition of the Ashtakar connection has been assumed to function of electric flux. Does it mean we are working on a second order formulation where compatibility has been assumed to be satisfied? Um, so, uh, I agree with what you say that I um, imposed metric compatibility and um, and torsion freeness. Sorry, I lost where I wrote this. Here it is. Um, so I'm going to impose both of these. And it does, as you say, make gamma a function of the electric field. Um, but uh, you and I are probably using language a little bit differently. Um, I am using first order formalism just to refer to the fact that you're using triads or tetrads as your variables. So in that sense, it's still a first order formulation, even though we've imposed that this is a nice levy chavita connection. Um, so it, it may just be a semantic issue. Um, but that's the sense in which I'm using um, first order. All right. I think I should stop there. <laughs> sure, we can wrap up for today, right? So, yeah. um, okay, then. And just to, to preview for everybody what we'll do next time, we'll take up the spin networks in a bit more detail, see how they work, and then we'll try to build a path integral formalism and understand what that means uh, in this uh, in these loop gravity variables. And, and that's what we call a spin foam. So that's what I'll do next time. The, the sort of most technical part will end there. And the final lecture will be on, um, on experiments and, uh, and sort of the, the edge of quantum gravity, what we, what we know and what we don't. All righty. Perfect. Th thank you so much, Hal. Um, thank you, everyone. Hal. So see you next week, same time, right? Yep. <laughs> okay, then. Uh, Ciao.